The Grossman-Stiglitz paradox stems from a 1980 paper by Sanford Grossman and Joseph Stiglitz. They argue that markets cannot possibly be perfectly informationally efficient, because if they were, nobody would expend the resources required to make markets efficient in the first place. Let's dig into what that means. I talk a lot about index funds on this channel. Index funds only work well in an efficient market. Market efficiency is a term that was coined by Eugene Fama in 1965, and defined formally, again by Fama, in 1970. He defined it as a market in which prices always fully reflect available information. If prices always fully reflect available information, then we would expect market prices to change as soon as new information develops. New information could range from a company announcing a new product line to changes in the broad economic outlook of a given country. If markets are efficient, stock prices should adjust to account for these changing conditions very quickly. If it is in fact the case that markets are efficient, then we would expect it to be incredibly difficult for traditional active investors to earn a return in excess of the market by exploiting mispriced securities. In a perfectly efficient market, undervalued and overvalued stocks don't exist. There's no mispricing that can be exploited to achieve above average returns. Under these conditions, index funds make a ton of sense. But coming back to the paradox, if everyone starts to index, then prices have no way of adjusting to new information. To dig into this, let's think about how information gets into prices. To explain how stocks are priced, I would like to introduce you to Richard Coffin, also known as The Plain Bagel on YouTube. If you haven't checked out The Plain Bagel, it is an excellent source of entertaining educational material on financial concepts, investing, and answers to frequently asked questions. Here's Richard, and I'll be back to finish off the video. Public stock prices are entirely determined by the transactions carried out by investors. There is no authority that fixes a price or tells people what to buy and sell a stock for. Instead, the prices we see are determined by the transactions of individual buyers and sellers on the market. Passive investors largely believe that when there are many investors present, markets will operate efficiently. That is that these transaction-based stock prices will reflect the stock's intrinsic value, or what they are actually worth. Active investors, on the other hand, often believe that markets are inefficient to at least some degree. Whether it be because of the irrational tendencies of investors and their behavioral biases, market anomalies, or the influence of institutional money flows on market prices, active investors believe that stock prices frequently trade higher or lower than their actual worth. But how do active investors know when a stock is expensive or cheap? Well, the truth is that they don't but they can estimate what they believe to be the intrinsic value of a stock and then compare the estimate to the current stock price. How investors get this estimated value can vary, but one popular method is through the use of the discounted cash flow model. There are a few key steps involved with the discounted cash flow model. The first of which is to forecast the company's future profitability or cash flows. This is where active investors carry out fundamental analysis and how they apply the information they have about a company. For example, perhaps they've looked at a company's management, their product quality, and their strategic growth plan for the near term, and see that the company appears to be a solid business, so they may forecast strong growth for the next five years. Analysts may also make adjustments for external factors outside the company's control. Perhaps they believe that a slowing economy will dampen sales in 2020, but that the cycle will recover come 2022. Or maybe because of higher input costs, the analysts expect margins to see compression for the next three years. Once an analyst has forecasted a company's profitability, they apply a discount, hence the discounted cash flow. The level of the discount is largely subjective, but it will be higher for high-risk companies and lower for more mature firms. This discount also helps take into account the variability of estimates. It's not likely that an analyst's number will be on the dot, but if there's a chance that the forecast will be completely off, then analysts will increase their discount on the future cash flows, thereby pricing in this added risk. Finally, the analyst sums up the discounted cash flows to get to the value of the company, makes necessary adjustments for debt, and then divides this amount by the number of shares outstanding to get to a stock's estimated value. They can then compare this value to the stock's current price to determine whether the stock is over or undervalued, and to what degree. So, active investors will often have some value that they believe to be the true intrinsic value of a stock in mind. 
And if a stock is trading below this amount, they may buy the stock. And it is through this process that stocks trade at least somewhat close to their intrinsic value. By buying an undervalued stock, active investors actually apply upward pressure to the stock price, which will bring it closer to the price that they believe it is actually worth. This is why when a company releases positive or negative news, we see prices react accordingly. Analysts update their models with this added information, which may boost or lower their estimated price and lead to a respective buy or sell, thereby changing the price of the stock. Without active investors, stock prices likely wouldn't react to positive or negative news, even though these could be things that inherently alter the value of a stock. Now that we have an understanding of the careful work and analysis that goes on behind the scenes to get information into prices, we can think about the effect of competition on the stock market as a whole. In a liquid and competitive market, such as the public financial market, the price aggregates dispersed bits of information. F. A. Hayek, a notable economist, pointed out in the 1940s that there are two types of information. General information that is widely available to everyone in the market, this would be something like an analyst report or a public press release from a company, and specific knowledge that each individual market participant has, including their unique views, preferences, and needs. One of the challenges for investors is that both types of information can move prices. Every market participant wants to be the first to bring to the market new information that has not yet been included in the price. If we think about what we just heard Richard say, all of those analysts are grinding through numbers in order to come up with a price based on their information and insights. If they get it right, while everyone else has it wrong, they will earn a profit in excess of the market return, known as alpha. The challenge is that no participant has the full set of information because each participant has some specific knowledge not generally available to others. The intense competition for profits results in market prices usually reflecting available information about the fundamental values and expectations for each company due to the hard work of analysts. But because each market participant has unique information, no single participant is able to interact with the market in isolation. We can now see how markets can be mostly efficient most of the time, while still allowing market participants the opportunity, but definitely not the guarantee, to profit after costs by being the first to bring new information to market if their information is better than their competitors. This is the equilibrium that allows the mostly efficient market to persist. Whether you want to be part of the race to profit by uncovering and bringing new information to the market, or be the passive beneficiary of those doing the work, is largely a personal choice. It's an interesting phenomenon. Despite the continual debate between active and passive investment management, the two schools of thought actually need one another. Passive management relies on active management to move the prices of stocks close to their intrinsic value. And active management relies on passive management to avoid excessive market volatility that would come from excessive buying and selling. Perhaps the two can actually exist in harmony. After all, as highlighted by the grossman Siglitz paradox, markets can only be efficient for passive investors if active investors find market inefficiencies. Thanks for watching, and thank you, Ben, for the collaboration opportunity. Thanks for watching. My name is Ben Felix of PWL Capital and this is Common Sense Investing. I will be talking about a new common sense investing topic every two weeks, so subscribe, click the bell for updates.